Welcome everyone, and happy Halloween. Tonight around the campfire, we have Enter Scare Sleep, Booze and Booze, Entropic Society, J Nightmares, and Horror on the Rocks. Now sit back, relax, dim those lights, and let's get spooky. So for starters, I've been dating this girl for a while now, her name being Isabel, going on a year very soon, and all is going well in that regard. However, when we first met, she told me about a less than ideal ex-boyfriend that she had a couple of years before she had met me. They still went to the same school, and he ended up going to the same university as us after we graduated high school as well. Apart from that, all three of us went to the same church meaning there was a lot of opportunity for him to meet us. The creepy encounters with him, Jose being his name, started a little before he graduated high school. After he heard we were dating, he was furious, even going as far as to say that I was abusive on Twitter, but nobody believed him, given his accusation was complete horse crap, and he was notorious for doing the same in the past in order to keep Isabel from talking to other guys when they were together. That was just the beginning, though. It started off small at first, seeing him at the mall whenever we would go out on dates, before it was illegal to go outside. After a while, it seemed like a little too much to seem like a coincidence, though. He started showing up to our church, which, although wouldn't ever really be abnormal, he all of a sudden joined the same youth ministry as well. It seemed as if he was trying to get as close to us as possible at all times. There was one instance that I remember very specifically, at a grad party everyone was invited to. Everyone was in the backyard, and I remember looking across the patio and just seeing him staring at me and Isabel from the other side. His eyes didn't move, and his breathing was very heavy, as if he was angry, anxious, or both. He didn't try anything that night though, probably because of the other people there that night. After I left the party and dropped off my girlfriend at her house for the night, I saw a black car following me for a majority of the way home, which I didn't really think much of, and not to sound like that guy or anything, but I wasn't too worried about it either. I'm fairly well built, and I've done martial arts for a little over six years. The next day, that same car was tailing me almost the whole day while I was running errands, Things got a little heated in the afternoon, though. I was sitting in my car outside of a store, waiting for a curbside pickup, when he parked a few spaces down from me, got out of his car, and came up to my window. He started yelling at me, saying that I would never be good enough for Isabel, that she still loved him no matter what I thought, and that he was going to make sure that she and I weren't together. I just tried to ignore him. Starting anything probably would have been a bad move, given that he hadn't even touched me or my car, but I was still a little heated. After heading home, it was already pretty late, so I just played video games for a while till I was tired enough to go to sleep. When I was walking back to my room, I saw him from my window, just standing there on the sidewalk looking right at me. The only reason that I knew it was him was because of the light from one of the street lamps. My parents had also seen him and asked me to go check it out since they aren't the youngest of people and wouldn't be able to do much other than yell at him to go away. But as soon as I walked out, he just got in his car and left. This happened every night for about three days straight. The last night I ever saw him was not like the others, except this time he didn't leave when I went outside. In fact, he started walking closer to me. I didn't notice until he was a lot closer, but he had something in his hand. I couldn't tell what it was, but it looked like a fairly large knife that you would use in the kitchen. Adrenaline kicked in, and I ran back into the house and told my mom to call 911, after which I went back outside. He was just there in the front yard waiting. When I stepped outside, he said, Isabel belongs to me, and I'm going to make that happen, no matter what. He ran at me with a knife, but muscle memory kicked in, and I had him pinned down after that. The cops came shortly after, and I explained the situation to them. 
after which he was arrested with a couple of different charges that I don't really remember. One other thing I do remember, however, was what was inside of his car. When the police came, they also searched his car to see if he had anything else that I should have been worried about. They found a bunch of tape, some rope, another large knife, a handgun, and a camera. I don't know what was going through his head, but I could at least guess from that kit he had in his back seat that he planned on hurting me in some way and recording it. I hate to think what would have happened if he had tried to come into the house while everyone was asleep, but I'm glad that he was arrested for what he did, or planned to do, anyways. In late October of 1982, 69-year-old Marvin Brandlin was living with his wife Ethel in the leafy green suburbs of Fort Dodge, Iowa. Their neighborhood they called home was a quiet, tranquil place, but every Halloween, the streets came alive with legions of trick-or-treaters. Marvin and Ethel delighted at the display of colorful and creative costumes and happily handed out candy to any children who darkened their door. In 1982, a Halloween fell on a Sunday, so in order to avoid any sugar-induced hyperactivity on what amounted to be a school night, the vast majority of trick-or-treating took place on Saturday the 30th. By around 9 p.m., a steady stream of visitors had started to peter out. The Brandlins believed the rest of their evening would be relatively undisturbed. Yet around 10 p.m., they received one last knock at their door. Marvin shuffled towards the door, half expecting to see one last group of trick-or-treaters outside. But when he opened up the door, he immediately knew something was horribly wrong. Standing on their doorstep, a man who appeared to be wearing a pillowcase on his head, Gazing out of two roughly cut holes were eyes that regarded him with a cold, calculating hatred. And when he saw the gun in the masked man's hand, Marvin realized that this was no trick-or-treater. The masked man raised his pistol, pointed it squarely at Marvin's head, then told him to back up away from the door. Marvin simply raised his hands and did as the man asked. Assuming he was some kind of armed robber, Marvin told the masked man that he was welcome to take anything he wanted. There was very little of anything of value in the home. According to Ethel, this was when the masked man told her husband something to the effect of, I know about the safe, Marvin. To Marvin's knowledge, only he and his wife knew about the safe he kept hidden in his own office. And realizing that the masked man knew of its existence must have been nothing short of horrifying. You see, Marvin had very little confidence in the centralized banking system and chose to keep the majority of his life savings much closer to hand. This meant that his safe contained upwards of $40,000, with a further $5,000 worth of gold bullion. And naturally, the Brandlins tried their utmost to keep the safe a closely guarded secret. But there was no time to wonder how the man in the mask had come to learn of the Brandlins' safe, because if he managed to empty it, the financial repercussions would be nothing short of catastrophic. With that in mind, Marvin suddenly lunged for the masked man's pistol, making one desperate attempt to save his fortune. But the man was fast, and too fast for Marvin, and in a split second, he sent a bullet ripping through Marvin's neck. Realizing that the robbery had gone horribly wrong, the masked man quickly fled the Brandlin's home, pulling off his mask during the escape route before tossing it over a garden fence. A devastated Ethel Brandlin quickly called 911, but despite Marvin being rushed to a hospital in Des Moines, he passed away during emergency surgery in the early hours of October 31st. With Ethel unable to give police an adequate physical description of the suspect, homicide detectives had no idea who the killer might be. The only real clue they had pertained to the killer's knowledge of the Brandlin safe, meaning there was an extremely high probability that the suspect was either a member of their extended social circle or even one of Brandlin's younger relatives. The couple's granddaughter, Teresa Trueblood, remembers hearing the news of Marvin's murder. You go numb, she told a local media outlet. I had to take my grandmother back to the house to get medicine. You walk in and you're just in disbelief that it's happening till you see the blood. 
and you know it's real. As months passed, the police failed to identify a subject, and Ethel became increasingly depressed and despondent. Her heartbreak peaked during Thanksgiving dinner. After suffering what amounted to be a nervous breakdown, she died a few months later. She just quit eating and broke down, and she cried and cried and cried, Ethel's daughter recalled. And you know, I'll never forget when they carried her out in a chair. It always said she died of a broken heart because she didn't want to be by herself. As of 2010, the case was reopened in hopes of gleaning DNA evidence from the discarded pillowcase mask. But sadly, forensic analysis were unable to do so. Yet perhaps the most terrifying thing about this case is that the Brandlin family and their extended relatives seem to know exactly who the killer is. The only thing keeping them from the justice they deserve is the fact that there simply isn't enough corroborating evidence. For the longest time, we didn't pursue anything because we knew in our stomach, in our gut, who it was, said Teresa Trueblood. But there was fear. Grandma always lived in fear. To this day, not a single suspect has been officially named in relation to Marvin Brandlin's murder. And his killer continues to hide in plain sight. So this Halloween, take caution who you open your doors to. Because hiding among the throngs of innocent trick-or-treaters could be some very dangerous people. I don't remember my sister Aubrey very much. At least the real Aubrey. She was seven and a half years older than me, which alone was a big enough barrier that we didn't really get to know each other. However, what made things worse was her advanced cancer in her body. She was constantly in and out of hospitals due to her condition, which made it very hard for her to have a normal childhood. If I was lucky, my parents would take me to see her on the weekends, or if she was home, she was not really feeling up to doing much, which I don't blame her. Things with her would slowly get worse when I'd get into middle school. I remember the whole family came to spend some time with her before the inevitable was going to happen. As hard as things were for me, I knew that my sister had it way worse. On one of the weeks of my sister's passing, my mom's brother, Uncle Rob, came to stay with us for a few days. Uncle Rob was the coolest. He was my mom's older brother who lived out of state, but he was the coolest guy. He drove a big truck and co-owned a construction company, which made him secretly wealthy. Rob grew up with only sisters and had no kids of his own. So, for whatever reason, when he came to visit, he made sure to make me feel special. I'm willing to bet that it had to do with the fact that I reminded him of himself. The Saturday he came to visit, he woke me up extra early. I think around 6 or so in the morning. My parents were still at the hospital with my sister, so Uncle Rob and I had the house to ourselves. At first, Uncle Rob waking me up on a Saturday at 6 was incredibly annoying. However, it didn't take him long to make me smile. Hey Jake, let's give your gaming setup an upgrade, he said while hitting me in the head with the pillow. I sat up in bed and rubbed my eyes. My mom was strict on what I did with my free time. She didn't like the idea of me playing video games in another room when I could be spending time with family or with my sister, which was fair. But kids are allowed to have fun every now and then. But Uncle Rob... I don't have a gaming setup, I said as I began to stretch. Oh my gosh, it's even worse than I thought, he said while pretending to write on a piece of paper and handed it to me. Here, it's your prescription to have a cool gaming setup, effective immediately. I smiled and got out of bed. Meet me in the truck in two minutes, we got a lot of work to do today, he exclaimed as he left my room and went out to his truck. I quickly got ready and met him out there. The early morning chill bit my face, but his warm truck quickly remedied this problem. So here's the deal, my fuzzy little friend. I did some measurements and I noticed that one of the rooms in your basement has a huge closet, my uncle said as he pulled out of the driveway. I'm willing to bet you that I could build you a secret room connected to that closet, and none of your parents would know. Perfect for a gaming room. What do you think? My eyes lit up even more. How would we do that? I asked, astonished. 
My parents will be home tonight. There's no way that we're going to get away with this. Uncle Rob gave me a look that said, Do you not know who I am? I've been sneaking stuff past your sister all my life, and I've never been caught yet. Plus, you forgot that I'm the best, and I can do anything. Uncle Rob took us to Home Depot and picked out some drywall, paint, and other materials to help make this thing happen. He had all the tools he needed in the back of his truck. After Home Depot, we stopped by a GameStop and picked up a new console with games, controllers, and even a headset. All right, now I'm counting on you not to get caught playing too much. And if you do, don't tell them that I gave you the stuff, he said while smiling. We went back home and began working on the room immediately. The basement had been recently finished, but there were still supplies and debris left behind. Uncle Rob started right away and cut a four-foot rectangular hole in the closet wall and got to work. Sure enough, behind the wall was a small opening, about eight feet by five feet. Ideally, this was a small space to not really be able to do anything. But for a secret gaming room, this was perfect. After a couple of hours of laying carpet, building the setup and covering the hole with a new piece of painted drywall, the secret game room was complete. At this point, I hadn't played much video games. Uncle Rob was able to show me a few things, but it took me a while to really get into it. My parents came home that night, and Uncle Rob and I said nothing about the cool room we just made. However, the excitement of the fun day came to a screeching halt, as we were told by my parents that my sister's condition had gotten worse. Uncle Rob went home the next week, and my sister ended up having to stay at the hospital. Aubrey, my sister, ended up having complications in the next couple of months and passed right before my 13th birthday. Things were never the same. Not just for me, but for my parents. But as cruel as fate was, I still had to grow up without my sister, and my parents had to move on. Four years later, I was on track to graduate high school and worked a job as a pizza delivery guy in my town. My town was small, so small that the beater truck that my parents gave me was able to handle the load of driving pizzas to the locals. Even at this point, my parents had no idea that my Uncle Rob had completely made a new room tucked away in the basement. I was able to talk to my parents into changing rooms so that the hidden game room was in my closet in the basement. I was needing money for college, so I worked overtime at the local pizza place in town. Most people knew me or my parents, so the job was pretty chill for most of the time. However, there were a few times that, driving late at night, that I thought I would see something, either in the road or just off the shoulder. Driving to drop off the last pizza for the night, I was driving to the more remote part of the town. It was early December, and the Colorado winter already provided snow to our small town. Most cars here are either equipped with 4x4 abilities or... The drivers are experienced enough to not have any issues. I was driving down the dark street to deliver the pizza when my headlights came across a flipped vehicle. It took me a couple of seconds to process what I was looking at. Smoke could be seen coming from the exhaust of the overturned car, and the hazard lights were weakly flashing. Oh no, I thought, as I put my truck in park and got out to help. I called 911 on my phone and went to see if the person driving was okay. The way the vehicle was facing, I couldn't see inside the driver's side. Out of curiosity, I walked over to the driver's side just to make sure that everyone was okay. Sure enough, sitting in the driver's seat was an older woman. She was upside down but still buckled in the seat. The vehicle was still running and the woman was surprisingly not injured, save it for a small scratch on the forehead. Hey, are you okay? I asked while peering into the car. Oh, I'm fine. Just a bit embarrassed is all. I can't believe I just did that. I just bought this car, the woman said, embarrassed. Don't worry about the car, ma'am. All that matters is that you're okay. I already called 911 and that they're on their way. Do you need anything? Do you want me to stay till they get here? Thank you so much, young man. Well... I can't really get out of this car the way it's positioned, so there's not really much more you can do for me. But thank you, the woman said politely. Well, I'll tell you what. 
I have to deliver this pizza really quick down the road, but when I'm done, I'll come back and wait with you until help arrives. I said in hopes to help calm the woman, or at the very least, to be polite. That's not necessary, but thank you for calling for help. I don't live far from here. I can call my husband to come help me. I walked back to my truck and got in. I was able to find the customer's residence, despite the home itself being poorly lit. A large man answered the door and handed me a crumpled $20 bill. I handed him two pizzas he ordered and offered him change, but he told me to keep it. I glanced at my watch and it was now 11.03. We were technically closed at 11, and I should have driven straight back and clocked out. But seeing how I would need to pass the rack back home into town anyways, I decided to check up on the woman and make sure that help knew where to find her. I drove back to the dark road and the car was still there and running. Help had yet to arrive. I knew that the woman told me that I didn't have to check up on her, but I did what I would want someone to do if myself or a loved one got in a wreck and went to check up on them. The time I spent delivering that pizza could not have been more than five minutes. So naturally, I didn't expect the circumstance to change much. I got out of my truck and walked back over to the driver's side. However, something was different. As I approached the driver's side, I noticed blood coming from the driver door and leading out into the snowy woods. Did she somehow get out of her overturned car? I asked myself. But then I realized that the blood was far greater than when it was about seven minutes ago when I last talked to her. I began to worry for the woman, as it would appear that her injuries were far greater than initially thought. I held my breath as I knew I was about to see something I wasn't ready for. I peered inside the car, and sure enough, the top half of this woman was gone. Her bottom half was still hanging upside down and buckled into the seat, but the top half had been viciously removed. I gasped. Did something take her while I was out delivering this pizza? Or did I imagine that she was still alive? I looked to where the blood led to, which was directly into the woods that surrounded the road. I walked over out of curiosity to see if perhaps something did take her. The dark night made peering into the woods nearly impossible. I pulled out my phone and turned on my flashlight to get a better look. The blood led deeper into the woods, which was begging for me to investigate on my own. But seeing how I was next to the woods and something just killed this woman, I wanted to get back to safety. I walked back to my truck and waited for help to arrive, which they did about 10 minutes later. The first to arrive were paramedics. They parked behind the overturned vehicle and started doing what they could do to recover the body. I got out to tell them what had happened, but I was still in shock. Did you call this in? A man asked as he walked up to me. Uh, yes. Yes, I did. I was driving by and I saw this car and called you guys. The paramedics talking to me thanked me and began walking back to the crash site when I said softly. I talked to this woman when I drove by. She wasn't dead yet. The paramedic stopped and walked back to me. What was that? He said as he got really close to me. Yeah. When I called you guys, the woman driving the car was still alive. I had to leave her to deliver this pizza and came back and she was dead. The paramedic looked at me and shined a small light into my eyes. Are you sure about this? You talked to her? Of course. And she was, for the most part, fine and coherent. The paramedics walked me back to my truck. Listen, pal. Thanks for the call and everything, but... Forget what you saw here tonight. Don't say anything to anyone, okay? It's for your safety. If you say anything to anyone about this, then they'll know, and they'll come for you. The paramedic then opened my truck door for me and told me to get out of here before the police arrived. Obviously, I didn't ask questions. I got out of there as quickly as I could while still being safe. I could see the other emergency vehicles ahead in the direction that I just left from. I got back to the pizza shop later than anticipated and got an earful from my boss. What took you so long? That drive should have taken you 20 minutes tops. I hesitated before speaking, remembering what the paramedic told me. Um, sorry. 
There was a crash, and I had to call 9-1 for them. My manager gave me a look to see if I was lying, but ended up not caring anymore seeing how he was about to clock out. Okay, whatever. Just be more mindful, he said as he locked up for the night. I drove back home wishing I had someone to tell about this experience, but I was so shook up with what just happened. Did me leaving get that woman killed? Or had I stayed, would I have ended up like her? These are questions that haunted me when I went inside my house. The lights were off inside. My parents were early birds, so they have probably been asleep for a few hours now. I was tempted to wake them up to tell them what had happened, but I figured it was something that could wait till morning. Thankfully, the weekend was here, and I didn't have to go to school the next day, and my shift for the pizza restaurant wasn't until nighttime. So, like any teen being bored, I went to my room into the basement, and went into my hidden gamer room. I normally enjoyed staying up late, but something about this night was off. Perhaps it had to do with the fact that I was tired from school and work, or having to deal with seeing that top half of the older woman removed from their body being too much. But nonetheless, something about this night didn't feel right. Around two or so in the morning, I got a text from my mom. Are you making that noise? I looked at my phone confused. What noise? I replied. My setup was nearly soundproof being in the basement. My parents shouldn't have even heard me scream if I did that, but I was being completely silent. My mom's text, for some reason, gnawed at the back of my head as I continued to play. About an hour later, I got another text. Where are you? Now I was scared. Why was my mom asking where I was at 3 in the morning? I was about to call my mom when I received another text from her, but the text didn't have any words, but two pictures. The first picture was taken in my parents' bedroom. The perspective was as if someone was standing at the foot of their bed. Two figures could still be seen in bed, but their conditions were unknown. The next image is what really concerned me. It was mostly blurred with light, as if someone took a selfie too close and the flash was on, but I was able to make out two things from the image. The first was the eye of whoever took the picture. Whosever eye was in this picture, their pupil was not circular, but rather a bar, much like that of a goat. The second thing that I noticed, in the bottom right hand corner of the image, was a mouth that resembled a dog or a wolf's. I paused. My mom was not one for jokes. She had become much more serious since my sister died. Whoever was texting me these images were clearly not my mother, but also currently in my house. I turned my game console off and removed my headset. Once doing so, I could hear everything above me. It sounded as if an animal with nails or claws was walking on the main level hardwood floor. Sounds of things crashing and even screaming could be heard. I knew right away that something was wrong. However, the sounds of whatever was upstairs seemed to move around the house. At one point, I could have sworn that the sounds made their way down the stairs and even into my room. I called the police and told them that there was someone in my house. I tried my best to be as quiet as I could, but seeing how scared I was, I felt like whatever was in the basement with me was for sure going to hear me. I told them my address and that I feared for my parents' lives and to get here as soon as possible. The 10 or 15 minutes it took the police to get to my house felt like hours. When they knocked on my front door, I nearly jumped out of my skin. By this time, whatever was in my house had made its way back up the stairs. I could hear whosoever footsteps run in the opposite direction of the front door and out the back door, which led to the woods. I waited. I wanted to make sure that whatever ran out of my house was a good ways away before I tried to answer the door. After a few seconds, I slowly left my hidden room and made my way out of my room and through the basement. All the lights were off in the house. Whoever was just here didn't seem to need them. I ran to the door and opened it to see two sets of officers at the door. It just ran outside. The two other officers ran around back while the other two came inside. I showed them my phone with the text images in my parents' bedroom and told them that I feared for their safety. 
The officers that saw my phone looked terrified. Where's your parents' room? It's on the main level and on the left side of the house. I can show you, I said as I began to lead them to their room. Why don't you wait outside while we check this out? You might not like what we find, one of the police officers said starkly while pulling out his pistol. One of the policemen guided me outside and into his warm cruiser. I sat in the front passenger seat and waited. I waited for the officers to come out, but they never did. More emergency responders arrived at the house, including the same paramedics from earlier. I was exhausted, but my adrenaline seemed to keep me awake. Finally, I saw the officers exit the home while guiding the paramedics who were carrying two separate body bags on stretchers. I got out of the cruiser and fell to the ground and cried. The paramedic from earlier recognized me and walked over and knelt down. I want you to know, though, you aren't safe here. Whatever did that stuff to that lady in the car saw you. Not only that, but followed you home. I'm sorry about your parents. The paramedic stood up and walked over to his vehicle, while more police showed up at the scene. This happened last October, when I was on my way home from a drinking night with my work colleagues. I caught the last train home, and I arrived at my station as it came up to 1 a.m. It was Halloween, something I didn't particularly care about since we don't really do much for it here in Japan. I live in quite a rural area, so the station was empty, or so I thought. As I walked down towards the ticket gate, I saw a woman in a costume. A bit too old to be a trick-or-treater, I thought, as I drew closer to her. She was wearing a witch costume. She looked as if she was waiting for someone. At the moment I passed her, she abruptly called out to me. Where do you live? I continued walking. It was surreal. I just looked over my shoulder. She was stood there, staring at me. She had long, dark, messy hair. And I remember at the time, only one of her eyes were visible through her hair. Yeah, that freaked me out. It was really bright in the underground station. But she seemed to bring a bit of darkness to it. I didn't know how else to explain it, but it felt like there was a light out above her head. Where there wasn't. Don't get involved, don't respond, I told myself, as I upped my pace and headed out the exit. It takes about 15 minutes to get home from the station on foot, and at that time of night in my rural area, I knew there would be no one on the streets. It made me a little nervous. While I was walking home, I heard a dog howling, and my footsteps seemed to echo behind me. I kept looking over my shoulder. I turned a corner to see someone stood underneath a street light, a silhouette of a woman. I wanted to pass by quickly. Something was really off about tonight. First time I've ever been worried on Halloween. Where do you live? A familiar voice asked. Shivers raced up and down my spine. It was the woman in the Halloween costume from the station. I looked back, and she took a step towards me, and I just bolted. I ran checking over my shoulder as fast as I could. I ran out of breath and got a stitch. Too many goddamn beers. I had to stop. I was in a dark alley. I looked back. I couldn't see that woman anymore. I walked down the alley, relieved. Where do you live? I froze in place. What the hell was happening? I was shaking. I couldn't see her at all this time. I didn't even hear her coming. It sounded as if she was directly above me. I spun around in all directions. I was really panicking now. I shut my eyes for a second, and when I opened them, I saw her slowly walking towards me. Where do you live? Why? Why is this happening? My legs were trembling, even though I was still drunk. I've never felt like that before or since. I didn't know what to do. She wouldn't leave me alone, and if I walked home, she would surely follow me. So I just pointed to a random house across the street from the alley and blurted out, There! I live there! The woman in the costume turned her head slowly towards the house I was pointing at and then smiled. She looked back at me one last time, still smiling, and then back towards the house. With the strange woman distracted, I took my opportunity and ran for it again. I looked over my shoulder to see if she was following me. But she was stood still, 
staring at the house I pointed at. She was so creepy. Was this some kind of Halloween prank? I had no idea, but I didn't want to find out. I got home and I triple checked all the doors and windows were locked. I stayed up half the night, watching from the window to see if the woman was out there, but I didn't see her. Time went by, but I couldn't forget about the strange experience. I can't really remember her face. My memory's a little bit hazy. I got shivers every now and then when I thought about that night. A few weeks after the incident, on a Sunday, I was taking a walk with my daughter in the neighborhood and I noticed a moving truck. The truck was parked outside the house I pointed at. Where do you live? I remembered that woman's voice and I shuddered. I thought to myself at the time, it's a coincidence. The people who live there are just moving out, but I wondered if something happened to them that made them want to move out. The owners of the house came out holding boxes. They looked exhausted and miserable. I guess something could have happened. In the house, I saw the silhouette of a woman. No, couldn't be that woman, could it? It could, I just couldn't be sure. I grabbed my child's hand and started to walk away. I don't go anywhere near that house now. We all have our favorite meal. Some people like a simple, healthy salad, while others enjoy a cheesy pizza. I am a massive steak fan. But for it to suit my taste, it has to be prepared in a specific way. You see, the trick is to let the meat marinate in honey for quite some time before serving it. Succulent meat combined with sweet honey? Uh, there's nothing tastier in the world. Some steak connoisseurs prefer dry-aged meat, but, but I enjoy it most when the meat is younger, as long as it is marinated in all-natural honey. Natural honey is absolutely necessary when preparing this incredible meal. If you use the fake honey they sell in supermarkets, you're going to end up with a far inferior steak. Honestly, I'd rather throw something like that away. Fortunately for me, I know exactly where to acquire honey of the highest possible quality. I go to the local bazaar every weekend. As soon as I get there, the honey seller I trust the most waves at me, knowing that I'm not leaving the bazaar with at least 10 jars of his delicious honey. Albert is an older gentleman, probably in his 70s. He's easy to recognize, you can't miss his grey beard and friendly smile even from a mile away. He's been a beekeeper for almost 45 years, I believe. There are dozens of other honey sellers at the bazaar, but none of them have the amount of experience that he has, which is very noticeable when you try the honey that he sells. He's a hard-working man that seemingly never misses a day of work. During the coldest days of winter, I'll still find Albert at the bazaar. While I'm wearing my scarf and my leather gloves, Albert is dressed almost like it's springtime. If I ask him if he's cold, he'll just crack a joke and say, Don't worry, the bees keep me warm. When I first met Albert, he shook my hand and gave me a small jar of honey. He looked me straight in the eyes and said, First one's free. I'll be surprised if you don't come back for more after trying my honey. It's organic and unfiltered. I like to think that price ain't too bad neither. And wouldn't you know it, as soon as I tried Albert's honey, I was hooked. One small jar with an Old Bear's Honey sticker plastered on it was all it took to turn me into a regular customer of his. Organic and unfiltered. Exactly as Albert said. Perfect for turning your regular steak into a five-star restaurant quality dish. Unfortunately, as much as I love Albert's honey, I'll have to find a new supplier soon. Eleven children went missing in my town last week. They were aged from six to ten years old and the police logically assumed a serial kidnapper was on the loose. The search for the missing children lasted about two days, before the police found one of them. The child was a seven-year-old boy. 
He was found dead in the local park. His nose and mouth were taped shut, and a large amount of honey was injected into his nose. The police immediately searched the nearby area and found a vital piece of evidence in a garbage can. Inside the garbage can was an empty honey jar. Even though the sticker on the jar was scratched off almost completely, they quickly found out who the jar belonged to. Albert was arrested soon after. The fingerprints found on the jar of honey at the crime scene were a perfect match to Albert's. During questioning, the old man had a stroke, which in turn left him in a comatose state. The police are hopeful Albert will wake up from the coma, because he's currently the only person that can lead them to the rest of the missing children. Or so they think. You probably want to know what I think about all this, right? Honestly, I'm just glad I stocked up on honey while Albert was still selling it. If I hadn't stocked up on honey, I wouldn't be able to feed the kids properly and their flesh wouldn't taste just like regular old steak. Their diets consist of only honey and water, three times a day. If I include anything else in their diet, the meat wouldn't taste as good. And believe me, I've tried. The younglings seem to enjoy their stay at my basement for now. If you don't pay attention to their never-ending screaming and begging, that is. I'm getting hungry. So before I go grab a sweet and savory snack... I'll tell you how you can tell when the meat is ready for the grill. It's actually quite simple. As soon as the skin and the eyes get a yellowish hue, that's when you know that the meat is ready to go. Two sisters lived at the old Thornfield mansion at the edge of town. The place looked abandoned. The lawn looked like some kind of exotic jungle with tall grasses, vines, and poison ivy growing together in a lush, chaotic medley. The roof peeked over the overgrown trees like a brown scab. As kids, we used to dare each other to go near the mansion but no one ever dared go inside. I heard strange stories about the identical twins, how they had some sort of shared telepathic abilities and could communicate with animals. They almost never talked, seemingly able to communicate entire thoughts to one another just by a glance or a nod. As a whole, the townspeople left them alone, and they left us alone. And when kids started going missing, no one gave the Thornfield twins a second thought. In reality, a lot of people assumed the twins were probably dead. They hadn't been seen in over a year by anyone in town. No one had the idea to go check the collapsing abestbos and mold-filled mansion though. Or maybe more likely, no one cared. People around town gossiped that the twins were the final product of generations of inbreeding. The Thornfield family tree apparently had very few branches and looked more like a straight vertical line. First cousins regularly married. Nieces were married off to their uncles and half-brothers married their partial siblings. Occasionally, an outsider married into the family, but as a whole... They successfully kept all their wealth contained in a small, tight-knit circle. They had gotten their money from the coal business. Over time, coal had declined, and so had their wealth. As they fell on increasingly hard times, the family members disappeared behind the once majestic walls of the mansion and cut themselves off from all contact with the outside world. The Thornfields had their own private graveyard on the border of the woods, and they did their own funeral preparations and diggings. The private graveyard in the middle of the overgrown lawn didn't do much to make the mansion more welcoming. 
They got their food and drinks dropped off on their doorstep and never left the property for any reason. Over time, many of the Thornfields died from suicides, overdoses, alcoholism, and murder. Some just disappeared mysteriously, never to be seen again. Eventually, only the two sisters remained, insane, hungry, and rabid as wild dogs. What's that smell? I asked my little brother, Howie. He wrinkled his tiny nose, scrunching up his face as if he tasted something bad. It smelled like a rotting animal carcass to me. I smell bad food, he squeaked. Howie was only five while I was 17. I had volunteered to take him trick-or-treating this Halloween. Howie pointed at a jack-o'-lantern outside an ancient cabin with peeling paint up ahead. Halloween, he said, jumping up and down excitedly as if he was holding back a full bladder. Look, Tony, Halloween pumpkin. Yes, yes, I see it, I said, taking his hand and pulling him forward. Howie went and knocked on the door. An old man peered out his glasses magnifying his eyes to owlish proportions. He looked down at Howie with his clown paint and costume on. Trick or treat! Howie cried enthusiastically. The old man smiled, dropping a few candy bars into his little pumpkin bag. You make a very professional clown, young man, the old man said in a quavering voice. You remind me of Corky the Clown. He used to be on TV when I was young. Howie shook his head. I don't know any Porky, thanks. Howie quickly turned and came back to my side. The old man watched us for a few moments as we took off down the street. The pale incandescent light streaming off of his house into the dark trees. The rancid smell seemed to be getting stronger. Dead leaves whipped around us as the autumn wind howled in triumph. As far as the eye could see, leafless trees reached up to the sky, their bare branches like emaciated arms raised in prayer to a dead god. The Thornfield Mansion was up ahead a few hundred feet to our right. The bare forest surrounded it, enclosing it like the walls of a prison. Even after years of neglect, the mansion still looked imposing and grandiose. Standing five stories tall, it had tall Victorian turrets that seemed to pierce the sky like a dagger. Massive bay windows looked out onto the empty street. In the center, a wide oak door stood, painted jet black with nightmarish gargoyle heads nailed to the exterior. They grimaced and snarled, their stone faces frozen in expressions of eternal displeasure. It was a depressing sight, seeing the paint peeling from the once majestic walls and many of the windows smashed to pieces. Jagged shards of glass caught the moon's pale glow, reflecting the points of light like the blade of a scalpel. Scary, Howie said, pointing to the old dilapidated mansion. I don't like it. Yeah, no one does, buddy, I said, trying to hurry him up past the eerie house. I wondered if anyone still lived there. If in an answer to my question, I saw the dark silhouette of a person in one of the shattered windows on the topmost floor. They stood in the tallest and sharpest of the Victorian turrets. When I glanced up, the silhouette quickly stepped out of view. Crawling out of the tall grass 20 feet ahead of us, I saw what I first thought to be an animal. Something naked and bloody dragging itself out on its belly, moaning in agony like a snake with a broken back. But I quickly realized it was too big to be an animal. Five feet long with deep slash marks all over its skin and large chunks of its flesh cut away. My eyes quickly latched on to the human features of the poor mutilated creature. 
I saw two blue eyes staring back at me from a mask of gore. They gleamed with extreme pain and mortal terror. Oh my god! I cried, running forwards. I still clutched Howie's hand tightly, pulling him close behind me. Jizo, what happened? <laughs> the person moaned through a mouthful of blood. They coughed. Dark rivulets of thick blood dripped from their thorn lips. No more, please. Their eyes closed and they collapsed. Their heads smacking against the road with a sound like a watermelon being dropped. I pulled out my phone trying to dial the police. I saw I had no service all the way out here. I knew that sometimes 911 calls could go through even without service if an alternate carrier had a tower nearby. I pressed send and raised it to my ear, waiting with bated breath as nothing happened. The phone continued to give a no service indicator. Howie stared down at the mutilated bloody sight with unbelieving eyes. He moved closer to me, pressing a small body against my leg. I felt him trembling. Tony, Howie cried, I don't like... The bleeding half-dead body came to life suddenly, grabbing Howie's ankle. He screamed, an ear-splitting high-pitched sound that shattered the silence of the dead forest. A wet spot spread over his pants as his bladder let go. How he reacted like a startled deer, running in a blind panic through the overgrown lawn of the mansion. The grass was nearly as tall as he was. He quickly disappeared from view in the shadows of the waist-high weeds. Howie! I hissed. Stop! Come back! It's not safe! But he didn't appear to hear me. His wail faded as he sprinted in a blind panic away from the dying person. I looked down at the gasping, gurgling body laying broken on the cracked pavement. I didn't know what to do for a few seconds. I needed to get help for this person immediately, but I couldn't let Howie get lost in the woods or get hurt. Looking at the state of their body, I doubted they would survive even if we had a Life Star helicopter here. Dang it, Howie! I whispered to myself, sitting out across the lawn. Pricker bushes and vines grabbed at my ankles like greedy hands. I could vaguely see the outline of where Howie had gone due to the broken stalks of weeds and plants marking his passage. But I couldn't hear him anymore. Howie! I called. My voice seemed far too loud, as if I had stood up and started screaming in the middle of a funeral. The mansion loomed overhead its broken windows looking down like dilated black pupils. Up ahead, I heard a door click softly shut. I looked up, my heart palpitating in my chest. I hoped Howie had not ran into the mansion. I didn't see why he would, since he was terrified of it, but why had the door closed otherwise? I sprinted towards it. The steps leading up to the front porch had great gouges and deep holes eaten into them from the passage of time. The ancient wood groaned under my weight, and for a moment, I thought the boards might snap. Howie! I whispered, pushing the door open. I thought of the dying person back at the sidewalk and swore. I didn't have time to go on a wild goose chase. I should have been trying the neighbors to get the police there. After all, the mansion had no electricity, so there was no way I could call for help from here. Come here now! This is an emergency, Howie! My voice echoed through the dark, shadowy antechamber. With trembling hands, I pulled out my cell phone and turned on the flashlight. Tendrils of black mold spread like rotten veins across the walls and ceiling. An ancient chandelier hung skewed from the ceiling, the rusted cables looking ready to snap at any moment. An overpowering smell of blood and rotting meat immediately assaulted my senses. 
I gagged, retching. I covered my face with the crook of my elbow, trying to breathe through the sleeve to filter out some of the reeking fetid odor. A once majestic grand staircase opened up in front of me, leading to a second floor whose balcony railings had long ago tumbled down. From upstairs, I heard a shriek of mortal terror pierce the night. I nearly jumped out of my skin. But it hadn't been the cry of a little boy. It sounded more like the cry of a man. I sprinted up the steps, repressing my urge to call for Howie. I shone my light into room after room, seeing furniture covered in dusty white sheets pushed off to the corners. Giant holes eaten into the ceiling allowed stagnant water to drip down. The place reeked like a swamp with undertones of something else lurking underneath. Something coppery. My stomach lurched as I recognized the smell of blood. I moved on to the once ornate bathroom, pushing open the door. Inside stood a nightmarish scene from hell. Hanging from above the shower, I saw a teenage boy, probably about high school age. He reminded me of statues of Jesus I had seen, crucified and broken. A cross hung down from the ceiling, suspended by a metal cable. It spun in circles, the chain winding and unwinding in clockwise and counterclockwise directions, as the boy's body writhed in agony. Nails bit deeply into his ankles and wrists. He constantly groaned, his eyes rolling like those of a horse with a shattered leg. A spiral staircase on wheels had been rolled into the giant bathroom, reaching up ten feet into the air where the boy's torso hung suspended. I saw a slice after a slice cut into his body. They crisscrossed his body, some slashes going horizontally, vertically or diagonally. Pieces of his skin hung off in strips, barely attached to his flesh underneath. Blood dripped slowly from dozens of gruesome injuries. The tub below was an ancient ornate thing with lion paw feet and a thick layer of rust covering its exterior. Blood soaked the entire inside of it, coagulating and dripping in dry rivulets. Looking down into its depths, I saw gallons and gallons of blood, far more than a single human body could possibly contain. It filled the tub nearly three quarters of the way up. The crimson hues opaque and shimmering in the dim moonlight streaming in through the smashed window. The smell of copper and iron in the bathroom was overwhelming. Please... The boy groaned as his eyes focused on me for a second before they started rolling back into his head. His skin looked pale and bloodless, his lips and fingernails taking on a bluish cyanotic cast. Get me down. It hurts so bad. I stood there speechless, my phone's LED light illuminating the horrifying sight in its ghostly white light. Who, who did this? I asked. His head rose and his eyes focused on something behind me. Her, he said through a mouthful of blood. Then his head dropped, his chin resting on his chest. I spun around. I caught a glimpse of a pale ghostly face disappearing behind the door. I heard the echoes of soft laughter. I sprinted after the figure. Hey, stop! I screamed. Come back here! I booked it around the corner, but she was gone. There were dozens of rooms stretching down the hallway, as well as a set of dilapidated servant's stairs. I swore under my breath. I tried to quiet my breathing, listening hard for any sign of footsteps. From the floor above me, a board creaked. I thought I heard a muffled sob. It sounded like Howie. My heart felt like a block of ice. 
I went up the servant's stairs, taking them two at a time. They groaned precariously. As they turned 90 degrees, I put my entire weight down onto the top step before the landing. When I heard the crack, I knew I had made a grave mistake. The wood gave way with a splintering shriek, collapsing into pieces under my foot. My stomach rose into my throat as I felt myself fall through the floor. I felt the air whipping past my head for a few moments as the ground rushed up to meet me. I remember landing hard on my side. My head smashed into the ground, sending pulsating dark spots dancing across my vision. Everything swam around me as the world slowly faded to black. I woke suddenly, streams of blood flowing down my forehead from a deep gash. I raised my fingers up to the warm blood. Pulling them back, I saw the crimson drops gleaming in the dim light streaming in from the holes in the walls and ceiling surrounding me. I groaned, feeling an electric current of pain race through my skull as I tried the move. I looked around, finding myself in a basement of some sort. The smell of rotting meat down here was overpowering. I put my hands down, trying to push myself up off the ground. My fingers sank into something wet and squirming. A rank odor like roadkill and rotten tomatoes filled the air so thick I could taste it. As I glanced down, a primal sense of disgust and horror filled my soul as I saw what I had landed on. Dozens of naked, decomposing bodies littered the cold concrete basement floor. I saw many children amongst the dead, their sightless eyes staring blankly ahead in their pale, bloodless faces. On all the corpses, I saw signs of extreme torture and mutilation. Deep gashes ran through their skin, slashed into crisscrossing patterns. Squirming larvae writhed and skittered through the wounds, consuming the desecrated corpses. Flies walked all over their open, staring eyes, occasionally paused to feed on the decaying flesh beneath. Retching, I tried to pull myself up, but my hands kept slipping on the slimy gore underneath. I felt the skin slouching off the swollen body underneath me. Rancid, sticky fluids sputtered out of the soft flesh, like dirty dishwater being squeezed out of a sponge. After a few minutes of struggling, I managed to crawl across the room, slowly struggling over dozens of bodies. Many were filled with rancid gases, which bursted out of their wet skin with a sound like a balloon deflating. The air filled with a sickening smell of sulfur and bloody pus. By the time I got to the basement door, my clothes were totally covered in a rainbow of horrors. Pus leaked out of the decaying bodies in orange and gory scarlet. Dark, almost black blood stuck to my shirt and pants. I felt the squirming of maggots all over my hands and arms. Panicked, I furiously tried to get the writhing larva off of my skin. A small, filthy face peered around the corner of the rickety basement stairs. I saw a small girl with sunken eyes and gaunt cheekbones. Her arms and legs looked like sticks. Her swollen stomach bulged over her protruding hips. She wore blood-stained rags that barely covered her sickly body. Her face pulled back from the corner. I ran forward, turning to see her sprinting away. With a few pounding steps, I caught up to her, grabbing her arm. It felt similar to a metal pole under my grip, no more than bone covered in a thin layer of skin. I'm not going to hurt you. I whispered to her as she struggled like a panicked animal. Her eyes went wide as she tried to claw at me in effort to free herself. Stop it! She gave me an animalistic growl, opening her mouth and biting the fleshly part of my hand next to my thumb. I repressed an urge to shriek in pain. Instinctively, 
I smacked her across the face, feeling her little mouth let go. I pulled her into a bear hug, raising her off the ground like a toddler having a temper tantrum. She flayed her powerful tiny legs, hitting me in the groin and stomach. Exhaling a long breath, I hugged her tightly until she calmed down. I'm trying to help you. I hissed through gritted teeth, feeling drops of blood running down my hand from the bite. And in return, you make me need to get a rabies shot, you little bastard. Why are you in here? Have you seen a little boy here? She shook her head quickly, her filthy, greasy hair falling over her eyes. Don't you want to leave this place? She shook her head quickly. Can you talk? She simply stared at me with blank, haunted eyes. You look like you haven't had a good meal or a shower in a while, little girl, I said. She grinned at this, showing off her sharp milk teeth. Something psychopathic and cold seemed to move under the facade of this little girl, like a predator swimming under the waters of a fetid swamp. A smell began to rise in the mansion then, a choking, suffocating odor. Narrow fingers of black smoke started to reach into the hallway, twisting and curling from something downstairs. The little girl headbutted me hard in the nose. In surprise, I dropped her and she skittered off. I followed her down the hallway, a rising sense of anxiety gripping me. I was wasting too much time here. I should have found Howie and gotten a neighbor to call the police already. I cursed under my breath. A vision of Howie dead, crucified and dripping blood above some ancient cursed shower rose in my mind. The little girl abruptly turned into a bedroom. Without hesitation, I followed. Beyond the threshold, I saw Howie with a knife to his throat. Behind him, a filthy woman with cracked, dried blood all over her pale skin grinned at me. She wore a gore-stained nightgown. Her dirty blonde hair ran nearly down to her waist, streaked with filth. Her dark eyes seemed too close together. Her bulbous nose and lips seemed weird, giving her face a slanted look. Behind her, I saw shadows flitting up and down the walls, black shapes with inhumanly long, twisted arms and legs. Dozens of them skittered like lizards, leaving a dark blur across the ceiling as they ran overhead. How he cried silently in the woman's arms, keeping his eyes tightly shut. Give me my brother back, I said, trying to portray a calmness I didn't feel in the slightest. Behind the woman's leg, I saw the little girl, clinging tightly to her thigh. This little lamb, she said, her strange accent giving a lilt to her voice. Now why would I do something like that? He has done nothing to you, I said, taking a step forward. The woman put the knife tightly against Howie's skin. I saw a drip of blood run down from where the point of the blade pressed against his jugular. I stopped, putting my hands up. I need his blood, she said, a fanatical gleam in her dark eyes. It keeps the skin flawless and young. It keeps us whole and connected. Don't you see? I have lived here for over a hundred years now. This is the only way, and they need to eat. She pointed to the skittering black silhouettes behind her. They take the meat and we get the blood. After all, the meat has the strength, but the blood has the cautiousness. A black smoke started to fill the room, acrid and thick. It came from the hallway behind us. Ah, my sister had started the ritual. The burning smell of insect flesh. It's sweet in a way, isn't it? I heard the slightest creaking of ancient floorboards from the hallway outside. But they are hungry, always hungry. She sighed. With her left hand, she gripped Howie's hair and yanked his small head back, exposing his throat like a sheep ready for slaughter. 
How he made a noise like a strangled rabbit, a high-pitched shriek of mortal terror slipping out of his trembling lips. Say goodbye, boy. The insane woman said as her eyes gleamed with bloodlust and determination. I ran forward, my face twisted into a silent scream. The wicked blade of the woman's knife glinted against Howie's pale skin. As she finished speaking, a gunshot rang out, as bone rattling as a dynamite blast in a confined space. The insane woman's head exploded in a shower of brains and hair. I spun, seeing the old man from the cabin. He held an aged rifle in one hand. His jellied ancient eyes slowly scanned the room. Howie still stood in the same spot, his eyes staring a thousand miles away, his little body shook and trembling like a man having a seizure. Come on, the old man hissed. Do you two want to live? Let's get out of here. I ran to Howie, picking him up like a sack of potatoes. I felt the wet spot of his pants pressing against my hoodie. Howie's head lolled like a ragdoll's. His face continued to emanate a slack, unfocused expression. He reminded me of a catatonic schizophrenic I had heard about. People whose bodies would freeze in a single position for days or weeks. How did you find us? I asked panting as I tried to keep up with the old man. He was faster and spryer than his old body suggested. I heard the screams from my house, he said. I saw you disappearing into the mansion. I brought my gun when I heard the screaming and... Did you see the body? I asked, cutting him off. Did you call the cops and ambulances yet? He frowned, giving me a strange sideways glance. Body? He asked, shaking his head. No, I didn't see any bodies. Just you disappearing into the mansion. But I knew that scream was coming from a young child. The smoke grew thicker as we descended the serpent stairs to the massive entrance chamber. There, we found the other sister. A fire raged across the entrance chamber's floor. Long tongues of flame shot out, licking the cracked, dried wood of the mansion. A filthy woman dressed in tatters stood there, looking nearly identical to the other sister we had seen. Her eyes looked so dark that they appeared black. Bizarre scars covered most of her skin. She showed the scarred outlines of occult symbols and slash marks proudly like an artist showing off tattoos. Black suffocating smoke rose in rounded plumes from the bonfire centered in front of the grand staircase. In the flames, I thought I saw something moving. I squinted, realizing that thousands of bugs squirmed and writhed in the flames. Insane and laughing, the woman took a metal bucket, pouring another load of skittering spiders, centipedes, stink bugs, and other insects onto the roaring fire. Insect flesh draws the watchers, she said, seemingly speaking to herself. As if on cue, those black shadow creatures from upstairs slipped into the room. They climbed the hallways and ceilings, moving in chaotic random patterns around the choking fire. They seemed to feed on it, to become more solid and black as the insect flesh burned and rose into the air. We have kept ourselves young with the blood of the lambs. She spoke to the air and to the smoke, raising her hands over her head. But with the final ritual, the dead things inside can now crawl out. We will become immortal. We will become deadless and transcendent, like the Watchers. Behind the woman, I saw the young girl. The girl hugging the woman's leg, grinning up at me like a skull. The old man raised the gun. Then he hesitated once he had saw the girl. I could get her with the headshot, I think, he murmured. I don't know if he was talking to me or not, but his moment of hesitation proved fatal. Kill them all, the woman hissed to the shadow creatures. No witnesses. As soon as I heard those words gurgling from her mouth, I grabbed Howie and ran for the door. 
The old man fired, the gun barking again and again. I glanced back, seeing the woman lying dead on the ground, the girl standing above her screaming. Dark twisted hands closed in on the old man. As I ran outside into the fresh autumn air, his agonized screams trailed after me. I knocked frantically on a neighbor's door. After a few minutes, we called for help. But as I stood in the street, watching the ancient structure turning to ash, I knew it was too late for anyone still inside. Dark shadows streamed into the nighttime sky, rising up with the pillar of smoke that blocked out the stars. As I watched, I thought I saw a filthy pale girl escape into the dead trees. <laughs>